your partner confesses saying she loves you, but you're in disbelief for whatever reasons you have. You're torn between the two competing propositions, creating a painful conflict in your mind. She loves me? No. She loves me not. However, you do not have strong enough evidence if she does or does not. But you're generous. You give her the benefit of doubt at the moment until definite evidence comes up in front of you. You are actively looking for a piece of evidence and voila, she cheated on you. Once is enough for you and you dump your partner for good. So, the uh, name of this tragic movie is called Null Hypothesis Significant Testing. Um, well, sorry about this, uh, um, you know, terrible voice acting. Um, I think I found the perfect song uh, matching this story, but, you know, that just a copyright claim is just uh, killing me. So, I couldn't just uh, insert the, uh, the background music for you make it more interesting, but um, I tried my best. Anyhow, in a nutshell, the null hypothesis significant testing is all about making a proposition, a proposition, statement, claim, argument to be tested against the counter proposition, statement, claim, or argument. So typically, the hypothesis you want to test as a recap and support is called the alternative hypothesis or H1. And the counter to the alternative hypothesis is called the null hypothesis or H0. So in this previous story, your supporting hypothesis um, is that she loves me not. So let's say that is your supporting hypothesis. Right? You're in disbelief. And the antithesis, right, H0 is that she does love me, right? So this pair comprises all the possibilities, um, meaning that mutually exclusive they are, and then exclusive to each other. So once you have the hypothesis set up, then you need a decision rule, which hypothesis you will choose based on the kind of evidence you will collect and how likely to observe such evidence under the assumption that H0 or the null is true. So in essence, you are giving the benefit of doubt to the null by a very generous margin compared to the um, H1. So therefore, to reject the null, then you need a very strong or extreme evidence that is highly unlikely uh, were the null hypothesis true. So the evidence of choice in the story is the cheating episode. And the rule is the um, the rule of decision is the uh, the number of cheating episodes, uh, which is pretty much up to you to decide how many cheating incidents will be enough for you to dump someone who says I love you. Um, well, I don't know about you, but uh, you know, once should be more than enough for me. However, I know uh, a friend who still thinks that he loves his partner even after he knows his partner is a serial cheater. So now you go out and looking for the evidence or data. And once you have the evidence, then now the ball is in your hand. You decide which hypothesis is supported based on the decision rule you set in place before you collect the data. Right? So if you, if you change your mind after the evidence, then you're breaking the rule of the null hypothesis and contesting. So statistical hypothesis testing um, is really um, you know, kind of a you know, decision-making process using statistics. And this statistical hypothesis testing is typically used in research wherever a sample statistics is calculated from measuring the variable or variables of interest. So to make a decision using this uh, process, um, you know, the comparison is the key. So 
you want to compare if your sample statistics of interest is different enough from the status quo considering the sampling variation. So here the status quo represents the null hypothesis when nothing happens, right? So when no change is assumed, then um, you know, where is your statistics basically, the location of your statistics, how likely um, it is that uh, you can use, you see these statistics at that location. So that is the comparison you're gonna make to make the decision. And the decision rule uh, is basically the probability or the likelihood of observing the statistics at a certain location. So you're going to use that as a decision rule. So that is the essence of the statistical hypothesis testing. So um, to give you a kind of a different spin on the, um, the statistical hypothesis testing, um, I'll give you some other example. And by the way, this is not personal confession of my drinking behavior, okay? So the story goes like this. I woke up with a terrible headache. So it was one of those extremely rare nights. I got totally drunk like a dog. I just don't remember what happened last night, and now I realize that I lost my phone. But I have no clue where my phone is. Um, but, you know, my theory is it should be somewhere in the house because that's where I find my phone most of the time when I'm home and sober. So only in a, a blue moon, very unlikely event, uh, once in a blue moon, my phone would be found outside of the house. So to find my phone, I use my wife's phone to infer the location of mine. So I hear the faint ringing telling me that it is somewhere outside the house. So in this story, my null is that the cell phone will be in the house. So that is my default position, assuming that nothing happened, right? Um, I know that it's in house. Uh, it's in the house because it is almost always, say, 95% of the time, if not 100%, uh, in the house when I'm home and sober. But wait, um, however unlikely it may sound, it is still possible that the cell phone is somewhere outside the house because I was drunk as a dog. So that is your alternative hypothesis. So hypothesis testing is very similar to this process of finding the location of the lost phone. So you have a pair of hypotheses about the possible location of the phone. And based on the mental model of the house and the surroundings, you know how likely each hypothesis will be true. So for example, you assigned a 95% chance that you will find your phone in the house. So Based on your hypothesis, it is, it is highly unlikely that you will find your phone outside the house, and that's why you assign very small fraction of uh, the likelihood that you will find the phone outside the house, which is, in this case, 5%. And please note that uh, the likelihood here is closely related to the uh, location of the phone. So, in other words, the further away the phone is from the house, the less likely it will be found. So now you ring the phone to collect the data and you hear the ringing and you decide the phone is uh, indeed outside the house, no matter how unlikely it was based on uh, where the sound is coming from. So null hypothesis significant testing is about making a decision about the unobserved location of a parameter inferred by the sample statistics based on a, this, a certain decision rule. So with NHST, we'd like to know whether the sample statistics is quote unquote significantly far from the usual or typical location, or it is still within the margin of error centered around the typical location. 
So to make such a decision, we need to calculate how likely the sample statistics is to be found in that location. So in um, null hypothesis and testing, we have a mathematical model relating the likelihood uh, uh, of the, uh, the statistic to be occurred as a function of different locations of statistics. So one such example is the sampling distribution, uh, as we have learned previously. So the most likely location of the sample means is where the population mean is according to the properties of sampling distribution. And as the location of the sample mean moves away from the center to the tail ends, it becomes more unlikely to observe such extreme statistics, which is described by the uh, sampling distribution. And in the context of research, we assign highly unequal weighting between the null and the alternative hypothesis. So we allow very generous margin for the null, whereas only tiny margin for the alternative to make it very difficult to support H1 against H0. So we will only be able to support our alternative hypothesis when the sample mean falls outside of the 95% confidence interval. Um, we will have more chance to talk about the reason behind this unequal weighting between the two hypotheses later on. And by the way, you can think of the 95% confidence interval as a GPS signal. So the middle dot here is the approximate whereabout of the sample mean and the radius of the faint blue circle um, represents the uncertainty about the current location um, by the GPS data. So next week, uh, we will go over the uh, steps running the uh, null hypothesis testing in much more detail with an example. Before we directly get into the nitty-gritty details of the null hypothesis and we can testing, let us start with a research to set the scene for what's coming. The baby in the picture is suffering from what's known as Hutchison, uh, Guilford progeria syndrome, which is an extremely rare and progressive genetic condition that produces rapid aging in children. The average life expectancy of the children with the syndrome is known to be 13 years old. In individuals with this syndrome, cardiovascular diseases such as heart failure or strokes are common causes of death in the teenage years. Unfortunately, there is no cure for progeria at the moment, but research for treatment is ongoing. As part of the ongoing effort, a clinical study in 2012 examined the effect of treatment with a drug called Lornar Farnip on a number of physiological outcomes. First, the researchers measured the pulse wave velocity of 18 children diagnosed with the syndrome. EWB is often used as a measure of vascular stiffness which is an important factor in cardiovascular health, and it is known that this outcome measure is abnormally high in children with the syndrome. In normal children, the average PWV is about 6.6 .6 .6 meters per second or less. Having said that, one of the research questions of the study can be the following. Is PWB of children with progeria different from that of normal children. Even though I made the research question simpler than what's in the slide, but in general you can summarize research questions of a study in more detail by identifying what is measured, why it is measured, and the expected results. So this applies not only when you conduct your own research, but also reading and critiquing other people's research too. So what is the outcome measure here? 
what is being measured basically. So that is pulse wave velocity, right? PWV in meters per second. And why did why did they measure this PWV? Because PWV is one of the indicators related to the arterial stiffness known to negatively affect the children with progeria compared to normal. So fast PWV is known to be responsible for accelerating the aging process in the progeria children. So when everything is measured, the PWV of progeria children as a group is expected to be higher than the given cutoff of 6.6 .6 meters per second. Okay, so we expect that the PWV of the patient children will be higher than 6.6 .6 meters per second. But the question is, by how much should they be different? Let's suppose that you measure the average PWV from the progeria children and say it turned out to be 6.7 meters per second then can we say that the difference is large enough uh, that they are abnormal? Maybe or maybe not, as there are issues um, such as accuracy and precision of the measurement, as well as the individual variations in PWV. Given that the measurement is collected using the same method, meaning the accuracy and precision are constant, what matters the most is then the sampling variation. Remember from the essential limit theorem where every random sample will have different sample means because individual makeup of each sample is different. Because there can be a million different ways to have a sample of progeria, uh, we need to take account into the sampling variation, at least for the uh, given sample size. This is the reason why people run the null hypothesis in the contesting as a formal way to test their research question quantitatively, as it is developed exactly for that purpose. In doing so, um, they can claim that their result is not just a sample specific, but more generalizable by considering the sampling variation. Now, we need to split the research question into two competing hypotheses, namely the null and the alternative hypotheses. Typically, the alternative hypothesis, or H1, is your research hypothesis that you support or expect to happen against the null hypothesis, also known as H0 or H0. Basically, the null is devil's advocate representing what if. It is the antithesis against the alternative hypothesis. The reason why we have these two competing hypotheses is that none of them can be 100% true or false in the game of null hypothesis significant testing. Whatever hypothesis you choose at the end of um, null hypothesis significant testing, you should always remember that you are only making probabilistic statement considering the possibility, no matter how unlikely it can be that the other hypothesis that was not selected might still be true in reality. In that sense, you should not say that you prove anything with all hypothesis significance testing, never, ever. Having all said that, now let's turn our research hypothesis into the alternative hypothesis where we expect to see the average PWV value of the patients is different from the normal value of 6.6 .6 meters per second. More specifically, difference should be shown in the direction where the average PWV value is greater than 6.6 .6 
If less than, then we have a wrong group of patients or they are not the right patients. In many instances, former is the default mode of setting up an alternative hypothesis, which is called a two-tailed or two-sided hypothesis. On the other hand, the latter is called a one-tailed or one-sided hypothesis, where you are only interested in the effect in the specific direction. However, even when the expected direction of the outcome seems crystal clear, like in the current example, two-tailed testing is still recommended as two-tailed testing considers both directions at the same time, and the direction of the outcome will become evident after all. There are lots of controversy behind which one to use, but I am not going to go over that in much detail here. When in doubt, just to stick to the two-tail testing only, then you'll be safe. However, I will use both one-tailed and two-tailed testings as I go for the illustration purposes to help you better understand the mechanisms of null hypothesis significance testing. For the current example, let's say we set our H1 as one-tailed as the following. On average, PWV of the patients will be greater than 6.6 .6 meters per second. Once you have your H1 set up, then your null is just the opposite. The null goes like, on average, PWV of the patients will not be different or the same, so it will be the same as 6.6 .6 meters per second. Please be aware that you do not implicate the direction of the outcome when setting up the null, even when you are running a one-tailed testing um, in your alternative hypothesis. For example, let's suppose that you set up uh, the H1 like this, uh, bottom one, okay, so this bottom one, on average, PWV of the patients will be greater than 6.6 .6 meters per second. Uh, then the null is still the same, so you're assuming that there will be no difference because null is about no difference, no effect, and there's no way we can figure out in which direction it will not differ or will be the same. Therefore, it would be wrong to set the null like, on average, PWV of the patients will not be greater than 6.6 .6 meters per second. So this is just a, a not the right way of setting up the null. So setting up the hypothesis um, in words can be quite mouthful. So sometimes you can use symbols instead to make it simpler. Because we are making inference about population, we will use Greek letters to represent the parameter, which in this case, the population mean. So the mu here, Okay. So mu here represents the population PWB we try to infer and to see if this parameter is same or different from the given testing population mean, uh, which is replaced um, and generalized with the mu zero. So here in this case, our mu zero is um, the 6.6 .6 meters per second, right? So these two um, equations basically the same thing, right? So if you assume no difference between the population average against uh, some kind of a value, the, another population mean value, then you expect that the difference between these two values should be equal to zero, right? And then, okay, that, that's the same way to say that, you know, they are basically the same. Um, on the other hand, if your alternative hypothesis is set up in two-tailed, then you are saying that these two values will be just a difference, right? And if you just subtract them, um, each other, then the difference will not be zero. It will be either positive or negative, right? But we don't know which one it will be. 
On the other hand, if you set up your alternative hypothesis in one tailed way, then you expect, so in this case, um, you know, the P W V. So the population mean that we try to infer should be greater than the cutoff, then the difference should be positive, right? Or the population mean um, in question is actually greater than the cutoff value. Once you finish setting up the pair of hypotheses, then you need a decision rule so that you can choose only one of them later. Typically, two probabilities are compared to make a decision. One is called a p-value, representing the probability of observing the test statistics, as big as the one that is calculated from the data or more extreme ones given the sampling distribution of the test statistics. The other probability is called a um, level of significance or alpha, which is another probability set to be compared against the p-value before data collection. Um, this is somewhat arbitrary, but the general consensus is to use 0 0.05 or 5% unless noted otherwise. The rule is simple. When the p-value is smaller than the alpha 0.05, then your result is statistically significant and you reject the null. In other words, your data are in support of the research hypothesis. Otherwise, you fail to reject the null and you do not have strong enough evidence to support the research hypothesis. We will talk more about what the alpha 0.5 means and p-value later in more detail. So this is the sample of PWV data collected from the 18 patients. Now let's calculate the mean and the standard deviation for this sample using Jamovi. Okay, so here is our PWV data. Let's just calculate the, um, the mean and the standard deviation. Perspectives. Under statistics, do not have any mixing. Only one to 16. Um, maybe we want to just have a button. There we go. So <clears throat> it's a bit skewed. Uh, um, so the mean is 12.4 meters per second and standard deviation is 3.64 meters per second. Now the you know, difference uh, between this mean value and the normal value of 6.6 uh, you know, seems big enough, right? The sample mean is almost twice bigger than the normal value of 6.6 .6 meters per second. But the mean difference is only a part of the story. No matter how big the difference is, the difference will be muddled if there exists huge variability in uh, the difference even though it doesn't really look like a you know, huge difference here in terms of standard deviation. So now let's calculate how unlikely to observe such sample means as big as this one uh, that we have or bigger sample means considering both size and the variation of the test statistics together. Given the research context, the test statistics of choice will be what's called the one sample set statistics that we can calculate using the equation, which was introduced previously. Remember, the equation pre uh, describes how sample means vary from the mean of the population from which the samples are drawn. 
Therefore, these statistics can be used to test how far or close a sample mean, so which in this case x bar of size n. So n here is the sample size is from or to the population mean, which is um, denoted as mu zero with a known sigma, which is almost always never known. And that is actually the, the population standard deviation. And this is not known, almost always never the case. So in many instances, including this one, we do not know the true population standard deviation. And that is why we are using a sample, right? Otherwise, there is no reason to infer a parameter the population parameter, right, from a sample because we already know about the population. Therefore, in practice, we use the sample standard deviation to approximate the sigma instead. So when standard deviation is used in place of sigma, then the resulting st statistics t does not follow normal distribution anymore. The sampling distribution of t statistics follows the t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So here the df uh, inside the bracket represents degrees of freedom. And for this one, the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So uh, 1 less than the size of the sample. And as a function of the degrees of freedom, the shape of the t distribution will change. So what we're seeing here in the graph are the four different t distributions with the different degrees of freedom. So as you can see, t distribution uh, is very much looking like a normal distribution, except it is leptocurtic. Um, you know, what that means is that the center looks slender, right? And then it has heavy tail, heavier than the normal distribution. So for example, uh, this black one, the black curve represents the T distribution with the uh, infinite number of degrees of freedom, which is basically the same as the normal distribution. And compared to this black one, if we look at the yellow one with uh, degrees of freedom of one, so that means you only have a sample size of two, right? Because this knee in Greek represents degrees of freedom again, right? And then when the degrees of freedom is one, then the sample size is two because it's n minus one, right? So as you can see, uh, it looks slender compared to the black one and then it has better tail compared to the black one, right? The yellow one is. So that is the characteristic of the T distribution. And so, you know, if you have large sample size, then the T distribution approaches to normal distribution. Now let's calculate the uh, T statistics. And now that we have all the numbers. So T 18 minus one degrees of freedom, which is 17 is X bar minus 6.6. .6. So that's what we are comparing against. And then standard deviation of 6.6, 3.64. And this should be divided by 18. Now, numerator becomes 5.8, and we need calculator below. So, so here's our calculator now 3.64 divided by the root of 18 is this. Now, because this has been the new uh, denominator we flip it and then multiply 5.8 
becomes 6.76. Okay, so the bottom was, oh, where did it go? And 0 0.86, I believe, and the answer is this, right? Yep, that's right. Okay, so um, what we just did was to standardize the sample mean by shifting it against the testing population mean of 6.6 .6 and dividing the difference by the sample standard deviation. That way, the size of our T statistics will tell us how close or far away it is to or from the center of the sampling distribution, which is 6.6 .6 meters per second. Now, how do we make a decision if this t-value is large enough to say that the sample mean is statistically different from 6.6 .6 meters per second? As I said earlier, you will compare the probability of observing the test statistics under the null distribution against the preset probability which is the decision rule we set in place before we calculate this t statistics so this preset likelihood is called the level of significance alpha and it is typically set at uh, 0.05 which is the area under any sampling distribution representing the likelihood of observing a critical statistics or more extreme So this is the standardized sampling distribution of T with the degrees of freedom of 17, representing the null distribution. So this curve tells you a relative likelihood a certain test statistics is observed given the degrees of freedom. For example, the most likely observation under this curve is um, T equals actually zero, which represents no difference right um between the sample mean and the testing population mean so basically this is the default position of the null assuming no difference however because of the sampling variation different observations are also possible with different likelihoods now due to the symmetry of the t distribution around the center if the observed statistics is far away from the center so this way or that way right um, then the likelihood of observing the statistics quickly drops off especially those statistics fall under the either tail ends will be very unlikely right so say here if the test statistics falls right here then the likelihood that we will see or obtain this large statistics is very unlikely so um when you know these statistics fall under uh, the either tail ends then we can say that it is highly unlikely that the sample statistics is same as the testing population mean right because the difference is quite large so um, it becomes more and more unlikely that these data are the same as the population mean or there's some kind of testing population mean value but the question is then how unlikely should it be right so we need to draw a line somewhere to make a call so that drawing a line somewhere is your level of significance alpha 0.05 or 5% chance level it is in fact um, the area around the tail end where it represents the 5% of chance 
under which a sample statistics will fall. So in our current example, our alpha lies somewhere on the right tail end of the curve as our H1 concerns only if our sample mean is greater, not less than 6.6 .6 meters per second. So that actually zero point in T, that's where 6.6 .6 meters per second lies, right? So we actually, because we're expecting to see um, our statistics is greater, so we only look at this right side, right end, right, to see positive difference. So if we predicted our sample to be less, then our alpha would lie on the left side somewhere here. Right here, um, which represents um, the negative difference. So just for the sake of an illustration, you can think of this alpha as a betting odds before the game starts. You place your bet given the odds. You run the experiment knowing what your alpha is. So you can claim the prize money if the result beats the odds. Otherwise, you don't. So just to reiterate, this is a preset odds before you collect the data. So you cannot change these odds after you see the data, like you cannot change your bet after the game is over. And by definition, the critical statistics is the boundary beyond which the area under the curve becomes 0.05 or 5%. So, um, so it is somewhere here. And that area under the curve from the critical statistics. So that is on here. So somewhere here, that is T crit critical statistics. So that is the boundary. That is your, you know, line, right? Um, beyond which area becomes 0.05 so that area under the curve is alpha 0.05 okay so critical statistics is the boundary um, but alpha 0.05 is the area under the curve from the boundary to the tail ends in this case we only consider this right tail but you know for two tail actually two if it if it um, is to be two-tailed hypothesis, then you would consider both ends, um, both tail ends. So then that means you have another critical, uh, T-critical statistics. Um, but, you know, we're going to talk about this later. Anyhow, so um, this T-critical statistics, the critical T-statistics, um, differs depending upon the sample size. Um, now we can use Jamovi to figure out what this value should be given the sample size. So here is our Jamovi again and um, you probably noticed if you look at this uh, you know menu icons up here that is probably different from yours right? So basically, uh, if you install Jamovi first, then the first six menus are the kind of a basic uh, Jamovi menu. But you know, other people actually um, created uh, kind of special modules to um, run special statistics depending upon the research context. So to calculate the area under the curve or finding out um, the critical statistics of a certain distribution, so in our case it's a T distribution, right? You need a special module called distraction, okay, this one, distraction. But, so you can actually download and install um, each module by going, like, click on this plus uh, sign, uh, and it says modules, right? If you click on the plus sign, then it'll actually give you like a list of installed modules, watch a movie library, and manage installed. Um, so you just click this manage installed, then it'll give you what's installed, 
So GMV, the first one analysis bundled with Jamovi is uh, the, the default base uh, six menus, the first six menus. And if you click on the available, and there are different modules you can actually install. And one of them, so for uh, the current purpose, you need distraction. Here, distraction. Uh, distraction. So um, obviously it is installed already for mine, but um, for you, you probably have this kind of um, button to click to install. So if you haven't done so, uh, please click this install and uh, make sure that you have this module um, shown up, showing up here in the uh, menu. Right, so let's just um, um, increase the font size. And then I'll just click on distraction and you will see uh, the different distributions. Uh, the continuous dis distributions you can use and we have normal t chi square and f distribution and we need t distribution so click t and the menu is quite simple so you have to just um plug in uh, give jamovi uh, the necessary parameters of the distribution so df is degrees of freedom so for our current example the degrees of freedom 17 right and lambda is the and the location parameter of the distribution which is the mean the center um central tendency measure um which in this case is a zero right it is normalized a standardized t so we do not have to change this now we have two different functions so the left one is to compute probability and the right one is compute quantiles. So quantiles basically calculate. And okay, so okay, if you just click it outside, then it'll actually change the shape of the T distribution, right? So this is a T distribution with the degrees of freedom of 17, basically. So because we want to find out, um, the critical statistics on the right tail end, right? Where the area under the curve beyond this critical statistics become, um, so the right tail end, right? And then somewhere here, you know, beyond which area under the curve becomes alpha 0.05, right? And the quantiles is basically the cumulative um, distribution. So, if you just tick this box, then it becomes activated. And what you need is the cumulative quantile up until the 95%. So the quantile, um, <clears throat> so basically I'm talking about percentile, uh, which is kind of a special uh, kind of quantiles, right? Because the right tail end was 5%, right? So the remaining left uh, area under the curve will become 95%, right? So this is basically the one minus alpha, but um, by convention, all these quantiles are calculated. The cumulative function calculates the area under the curve from the left side to the right. So that is coming from the calculus, right? The calculus convention where the integration of any function starts from the negative side or in the negative infinity to the right end so you will enter 0.95 and um, calculate the cumulative quantile right so what it actually calculate was the cumulative quant the 95 percent you know quantile um, and and that's and it actually gives you the t value on the x axis so this is the boundary where the left side of the curve becomes 95 percentile right so the remaining uh, right tail end will become five percent 
or 0.05 and that boundary is 1.74 so that is our t crit the critical statistics so from that statistics the area under the curve to the right tail end will become 5% from alpha 0.05 so to um, check this we can actually you know um, type in this value and calculate the probability so this big p represents cumulative probability um, that the big x so that's just any t value that is greater than or equal to this x1 value so let's just take this then the this yellow area represents the p value uh, when the statistics on the x-axis is 1.74 and the probability is exactly 0.05 right so they, they are just go hand in hand so what we calculated here is actually correct right so going back to our slide so the t critical statistics for that is 1.74 right for the t distribution of degrees of freedom 17 that's how you calculate um, the critical statistics using Jamovi, given the um, the area under the curve And finally, p-value is the probability of observing the sample statistics as big as the one we have or more extreme. So uh, in this case, our sample statistics becomes boundary to calculate the area under the curve, which is the p-value of the statistics. Again, we can calculate the exact p-value given the statistics and the sample size using Jamovi. So here is our Jamovi again. So let's just untick this. Now we can compute probability. So now what we're interested in is the p value, right? So we need to calculate the probability. Now then that means we know that our test is statistics, right? So that value, what was that? That was 6.76. That was our t right so that's why we plug in that number to find out the probability that we'll see this statistics as big as this one or more extreme so to the right end so if we just click it and um, p is zero uh, which is not true it is just close to zero it is just so small that it is not actually showing me uh, the right number but let's see if we increase no still this okay i mean it is not zero and you cannot say that this is zero okay um because no p value becomes zero under no hypothesis significance testing um so what that means is that if we look at if we go back to um the slide see our critical statistics was here 1.74 right somewhere that was our t crit and where is our test statistics it's somewhere out here right as a four five and six point seven six is almost seven so it's just a far out here so the probability is quite small um compared to the point of five right it's alpha here um, but obviously our test statistics is much smaller so our p value will be much smaller too 
So this is test statistics T um, observed. Okay. So in this case, our T statistics from the data uh, is much greater than T critical statistics. Um, and the P value, so the probability that we will see this statistics is much smaller compared to alpha 0.05. So that means our test statistics is significant. So it's a significantly different from no difference. So that's what that means. So here is um, a summary table to you know, how to make a decision with null hypothesis and weakness testing. So um, the conventional way to make a decision in null hypothesis and testing is to use p-value, compare the p-value against alpha 0.05. This is more convenient in general because um, you know, alpha 0.05 uh, never changes basically uh, unless noted otherwise. You know what I mean? So you don't have to calculate the alpha all the time to compare the p-value. Of course, the p-value you need to calculate from your statistics, but you know your statistical software will give you the p-value automatically, pretty much. So all you have to do is to compare p-value against alpha, right? And when the p-value is less than alpha 0 0.5, 0 0.05, not 0.5, right? 0 0.05, then you reject the null of no difference, right? So it is not likely that your statistics is um, same as the test, uh, the, the cutoff value or the value that you're comparing, right? So your statistics or your mean, sample mean is different statistically, right, from um, the whatever value you're comparing. Otherwise, you fail to reject the null, okay? I, I know that, you know, you may find it very strange to make a decision this way, but it is all about the null, uh, um, as the name of the game suggests, the null hypothesis significance testing, okay? So, personally, I know that some other people do this, you know, accept, you know, reject, um, but um, I don't like that convention, so I only reject the null or fail to reject the null. Um, so you might want to just get used to this um, way of saying or the way of making the decision. So all you have to remember is to reject the null of no difference uh, when P is less than alpha 0.05. That means your alternative hypothesis is supported. Right? You have strong evidence to support your research hypothesis, basically. Otherwise, you fail to reject the null. And so you do not have strong enough evidence to support your alternative hypothesis by failing to reject the null. So the other way to make the same decision is to use test statistics, in our case, T statistics. So if the absolute value, these two vertical lines represent absolute value. So basically, you do not care about the sign of the value, right? You only care about the size of the value, T statistics. So if the T value is greater than the critical T, right? Um, beyond which error that curve becomes 0.05, then you will reject the null. Otherwise, you fail to reject the null. Right. Um, so the inequality sign actually goes opposite between these two. If you use p-value, then you reject the null when the p-value is less than alpha 0.05. Whereas if you use test statistics to make the same decision, you reject the null when the t test statistics is greater than critical statistics. If it is too confusing, then you can only use this one, the p-value against alpha. So all you have to remember is that you reject the null when P is less than alpha 0.05. That's all there is to it. Now, the previous hypothesis testing is called a directional or one-tailed or one-sided testing because our alternative hypothesis 
um, only concerned with a single direction of the difference, which was made explicit in the alternative hypothesis. However, in many cases, you don't have a clear prediction about the direction of the difference because it is not always the case you know the expected direction of outcome, which is why the two-tailed testing is safer. Just to reiterate, when you are setting up a pair of hypotheses, null is always stated as there will be no effect, no change, or no difference between the values being compared. So no direction is implicated when you're setting up a null. The direction of the difference is only made clear when setting up the alternative, uh, uh, alternative hypothesis um, in one-tailed way. So if you do have the directional prediction about the difference, then your hypothesis is called one-tailed or one-sided. If the uh, direction of the difference does not matter, or you are not sure about the direction of the difference, then you can make your alternative hypothesis two-tailed or two-sided. So in our previous cases, um, we have one-tailed in the right tail end, right? Because we expect the mu is greater than the mu zero, which was 6.6. .6. And the p-value is uh, the area under the curve where the t's, the t-value is greater than a certain t, right? which was 1.74. But if you expect your uh, mean is less than certain value, then you are concerned with this left tail end. And the probability is defined as the area under the curve from the negative t up right, to uh, the left and uh, the negative infinity. Okay. And when you do not have such directional hypothesis, then your alternative hypothesis becomes two-tailed, where you predict that your sample mean or the population mean will be just different, different than a certain value, mu zero. So the difference can be either in positive or negative direction, and the p-value is two times of both sides, right? So there is this you know, an absolute value sign around the t. So it's a negative t and positive t. And you're going to add the p value on both sides to um, calculate the two tailed p value. So this is pretty much all about how to play the game of null hypothesis significance testing. So the principle applies to um, all the other statistical analysis um, so all to, so basically you just run the statistics and make a decision um, by comparing the p-value of that statistics um, against alpha 0.05 so if the p-value is less than alpha 0.05 right if your p-value is smaller uh, than alpha 0.05 then you have something significant otherwise you don't so that's all there is to it so now, next time, we're going to talk about you know, different test statistics and different um, research contexts to apply you know, which statistics is appropriate.